Our next speaker is Todd Cutler, who is Vice President and General Manager, Design and Test Software at Keysight Technologies. Todd holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Georgia Tech and a master of science in electrical engineering from Stanford. His talk is the high frequency, high speed design revolution ahead, why your design and test flow will soon be obsolete. And he's gonna to speak to us about what he believes is a revolution in the design and measurement industry. He will also detail what this means for next generation chip, package, board, and system design. And paint a picture for what a typical design and test flow will look like in three, five, and 10 years from now. So please welcome Todd Cutler. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is the mic on? You can hear me? Okay, good. Well, it's a tough act to follow. It's a very famous uh, Dr. Eli. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting story. I said, I'm, uh, there he goes. Off we go. I'm Todd Cutler from uh, Keysight Technologies. And in the next few minutes, I want to just sort of present my view of how we, what I believe we're on the cusp of really major change in the way we do design and test. Um, and the reason that change is really being driven by new customer requirements on our communication systems. And that in terms is creating new communication systems themselves, which ultimately means we have to change the way we do design. So um, what I'll do though, before we kind of go into the future, I thought it's always good to kind of take a look at the past. You know, in the early days of uh, design and, uh, and software, actually when I was around in the, in the early 80s, or late 80s, I guess, uh, things were really starting to boom. In fact, if you looked at this, these were early phones and stuff. They were, were really hot, they were going. In fact, they were really big, right? They were physically big. I don't know if you remember having telephones that you'd carry with that little car battery. It had one just about like that, uh, that phone there on the, uh, that you see on the front. Uh, going along with it, the uh, test equipment was also pretty big uh, along the way. It was in those days, actually, I moved from the kind of the comfort of a factory job at uh, Hewlett Packard out in, into the field. My, uh, my best customer was a Motorola down in Florida, which made pagers, right, and also made uh, 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 mobile radios for, uh, for police radios. It was in those days that uh, people were just moving from MS-DOS into uh, to Unix workstations. So we had these computers that had way more power, had great displays, at least we thought they were great displays, 19 inches, right, of, of display. And uh, it allowed us to move from going from what were just little net lists and very simple computers to schematic capture, from linear simulation to nonlinear simulation allowed us to really make some pretty big breakthroughs. As a field engineer, unfortunately, those computers, which were really cool, were also really heavy. And uh, I remember very vividly, you know, back in the days, I'd actually, I think I have a picture here, you have to wear a coat and tie, right? Even when you're in South Florida, you'd have to wear a coat and tie, right, when you, when you do this, right? Not a bow tie, it was a long tie, you know, either one, it's the same, same effect. Right, but had to wear this tie, and so you'd get this big 19-inch monitor, and you'd get this, which weighed, I think, 50 pounds, and the computer itself weighed about 35 pounds. You put them on a cart, and you'd be amazed how quickly you can go from cool and calm to just completely drenched, right, and just walking across one, one parking lot. But in the end, it was really worth it, because I think when you looked at the designers there at Motorola, they'd made tremendous breakthroughs. Whereas before, they'd been very much in a cut and try variety. One of their key challenging elements was to make great VCOs inside the design and it was a very long process. And they're able to come up with a very good process where they could design the VCOs, get them to work the first time, and not only the people who are the advanced designers, but they were able to develop a process that could then be used by a lot of engineers across, uh, across Motorola. And that really was exciting, uh, pretty exciting time. In fact, that's where the little smile came on my face because I was happy I'd get on my little heavy telephone with the car battery and call back and, and celebrate, the, uh, celebrate the progress. Design in those days, design and test in those days, they, they, were, they cohabitated, they were in the same place, but it's a pretty simple flow, if you really look at it. it uh, you'd start first, you had some components, if you want to have good, good simulation results, you've got to start with uh, good models of your components, and that comes from measurements. You measure the R's and L's and C's and transistor, develop models as necessary. You take those models and put them together again into a schematic capture-based package, this is the old microwave design system, or MDS do a little simulation of performance. And then when it came back, you would do the, uh, do the measurements on, on these things. And it was pretty much a left to right kind of uh, channel that you would go through, and uh, pretty simple. So they were in here, but they're very distinct, uh, dis distinct uh, stages that, that would go through. Okay, so if you fast forward to today, you know, what's happening today? Here's a current cell phone, just a schematic. And if, if you look at what we're doing, we're actually doing almost identically to what we did many years ago. 
There's a lot more content, a lot more circuitry that's on a modern uh, circuit board and, and a cell phone, a lot more components. They're a lot more tightly spaced. If you look at the um, design that goes into it, it's a multi-band, uh, uh, we have most of these phones have multiple bands, and there's a lot of bands, so a little bit of complexity. But at the same time, we're really pretty much following exactly the same design flow that we did back uh, 20 years ago. You start with modeling, right? You go to, uh, to a simulation, and then you do some measurements. Now, of course, along the way, when you're doing the modeling, it's much better than it used to be. We've got great fixtures that we're able to use. We have much better test equipment. We have super-duper probers that are able to very accurately get into the small components as needed. Uh, the circuits are designed with much more powerful tools that simulate faster, run on much faster computers. EM simulation, which was hardly heard of back in those days, is a very common uh, tool that is able to get first-pass uh, results much, much faster. Even thermal tools are now uh, appearing in the marketplace that make it uh, possible to, do, to compensate design for thermal effects, which you wouldn't have even dreamed of uh, many years ago. Same thing goes for the, the measurements, right? The measurements are in smaller form factors. They run a lot faster and a lot more automatic than ever been. But at the same time, it's the same left to right flow with separate distinct stages along the way. So I believe this is all changing. And I think it's changing right in front of our eyes. I think one of the drivers inside of this is 5G, which I, I'm sure you'll be, we'll be hearing a lot about uh, this week. Uh, it's also, you're seeing the same thing going on in radar systems as well, which you hear a little bit after, after I talk. Because now what we're looking at is just the complexity of the channels is exploding. Instead of having a single channel, or maybe even a simple MIMO channel, going to massive MIMO channels where you can have tens or hundreds or even thousands of elements that go into these, into these modern arrays. As these systems get very complex, there's just simply no way that you can simulate and mod model them at any level of accuracy. You can do it at sort of a high-level behavioral function, but you have to get a little bit closer to it. So what we're finding, and we, we've been doing this for a while, some of these, you're able to, uh, this particular beam steering example that we have, and instead of trying to do this all in a virtual simulation world, you're pretty quickly, and you're better served really to get to a physical world along the way. So here we're taking uh, some simulated waveforms, we put it into arbitrary waveform generator, we generate the signals, we receive them back on the other end to, um, to, to see what, uh, what the performance and the results is. This is just one of the dimensions I think we're getting pushed at. The other dimension in the same area we're going to be pushed at is just the bandwidth. But if you look at uh, what we've typically done is dealt with maybe a few tens of megahertz of bandwidth. Now we're going to multiple gigahertz of bandwidth. So not only the channels are way more complex, the amount of data that's flowing through it is just hugely more. And no matter how powerful your computers are or how big your farm is, you simply cannot get the full design uh, analyzed in, in a virtual world. So to me, and my, you know, I'll, I'll uh, assert here through the talk, is to address these kinds of challenges, we fundamentally need to change the way we do design and test. If you move forward to the, uh, to the digital world, the high-speed digital world, in this case, it's not the channel complexity necessarily, it's the number of channels, and it's just the volume of data that's being transmitted. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we had 40 gigabit links that had been deployed, and, and basically a bunch of companies trying to make 40 gigabit links just went out of business because there was no demand. There simply wasn't enough demand for the, uh, for the bandwidth. And yet today, you move forward to today, what's happening? 100 gigabit links are being put out. People are in a mad dash to get to 400 gigabit links. So the, the thirst for data is, is absolutely out there. And what's driving it? Well, video's a big one. You know, we've all heard about Netflix takes whatever it is, half of the bandwidth in the, in the evening hours of, of our network. But I think it's more than that. I mean, the, every, everywhere I go, and I'm sure you do too, it's big data, right? Big data is being talked about. And uh, maybe more than that, in uh, last week, I was talking to a researcher who's working on a project where he actually has to move 10 petabytes of data across the country so he can do processing on his, on his local computer. And this is an incredibly hard problem to solve. So I think what we're seeing is, in this case, the complexity is taking a little bit different form. It's just in the amount of data that needs to be transmitted, which what this results in is, is very complex transmission equipment. So you look at these boards, and these boards are 24 by 18 inches. They have dozens of layers inside of them. They have multiple, multiple channels with all kinds of complexity that goes, goes into it. So while we, we will be able to simulate and are successfully model sections of these things, in order to really look at the whole board, we need to have a combination of simulation and measurement. The final kind of dimension on this I'll look at is just the Internet of Things. Uh, in this case, the issue is not the complexity of the channel. It's a pretty simple channel. It's just the number of channels. So I was talking to a, a base station team uh, just a few weeks ago, 
And uh, what they're trying to do is they're putting together base stations that are going to have to deal with the Internet of Things, and they want to simulate this under real-world conditions, which means there may be 50,000 different components they are simultaneously trying to communicate with the base station. So how do you do that? Well, it's not practical to get 50,000 signal generators hooked up together to test your system. So instead, you go to virtual world. So in this case, this merging of what's going on is sort of turned around in the other dimension. Instead of simulation being limited, it's the measurements that are limited. And this is where simulation technology is able to actually help the, uh, the measurement solutions. OK. So what does this mean? If, so I, my conjecture has been, or my assertion has been, that to date, the way we really work with these things in, in these tools is we have design simulation, we have test and measurement, they're really separate islands. Yeah, they pass some data back and forth, but they're very separate, and they're very separate parts of the uh, design phase. And my belief is that these things are really pulling together, and they are merging, and simulation and measurement are blending. And I'll have a couple of examples where I think you're seeing it's already happening, but I think it's just the beginning. Our workflows are fundamentally going to be changing in how we do design. So if we go back to the uh, kind of that, that MIMO system that we were looking at earlier, you know, how do you, what's, what are people doing now and what are they going to be doing as they go forward? Well, you're still simulating this thing. You're still doing architecture in the early days of the uh, design of this. You do a high-level block diagram architecture, and there's some tools that are helping you do that. You'll design individual channels so, so that you get the right kind of performance that uh, is needed within a channel, and you may even take into account adjacent channel and coupling. But then, when you get to that point, instead of trying to go through an entire system and pull it together, you very early in the system uh, actually go and prototype it and pull these things together and make measurements. And then based on that prototype and measurement, you come back to the simulation area, and that is where you're doing your system, system level refinement and design. And uh, this is, by the way, it's not a theoretical thing. This is what people are having to do now to do this, this sort of testing. You look at these massive MIMO systems and how they're being designed. They're very complex, and it's a very tight blend that we're seeing that is going on between the design tools and the measurement tools. Let's look at another example coming along the same, same line. In this case, it's the high-speed uh, high view. So here in the high-speed view, again, you're going to start in a virtual world. You think of those big, large uh, telecom boards that are inside. It's very hard to analyze those boards altogether. They may have dozens of serial and parallel buses all within a, a given board. So what we're seeing here in the upper left is just one channel that's uh, being cased. In this case, it's a, it's a parallel bus. Uh, here we're going to use some really fine design tools to come up with projections of what's inside. But what we'll very quickly do is also come up and, and run these prototypes early in the system and do the measurements. The advantage we have here, uh, we're showing these tests in both cases is being able to use exactly the same tests that you have in the virtual world, where you're simulating this, as you do in your measured world, and try to get that same correlation so that you can get the level of system performance that is, is needed. OK. So in this short time, I could only make a, a, a few high-level high observations about the changing nature of design and test. I've been in this business a long time, and I, I fundamentally believe that we're seeing challenges being put in front of us now that are unlike any ones that we have in before. Instead of looking at single channels, it's massive channels. Just the sheer magnitude and complexity of the systems has gone up in a very dramatic way. So I have to ask you, and I think all of us as a community, have to figure out how are we going to work together so that we're able to come up with new solutions to, to these problems. And I hope you'll agree with me that the world is changing, that design and test are moving together, and we need a whole new level of uh, integration to make them happen. I'm excited. I think it's going to be an exciting new uh, opportunity, and I look forward to hopefully working with all you guys to come up with and develop new solutions to these uh, workflows. So with that, I'll close, and thank you very much. <laughs>